Hey there, welcome to this video on memory model. Uh, in the previous video, we took a look at the computational model followed in the 1970s, right? Or rather, we wanted to understand how the systems in 1970s looked like. And, you know, I reasoned that there was like a CPU, there was like a memory, uh, R, Y. Okay, there was a memory, CPU would send over an address. Uh, and this was called the address bus. And then in return, the memory would send back data and the data could be interpreted as uh, an instruction or the actual data to be processed depending on which phase the cpu is in now then i added this that you know the cpu could also write data to the memory what i missed on mentioning is that there is an extra line which conveys whether the cpu wants to read or write right uh, and this data was the uh, data bus and this read and write bar essentially means if the line is one then the cpu wants to read data could be an instruction as well but it wants to read and if it is a zero then the cpu is intending to write uh, data to the address that is being floated right so this was the the computational model from 1970s how the computer systems were and now what we want to do as part of today's video is to focus on memory and then specifically try and come up with models of memory or actually just one model of the memory that we would want to use going forward now the idea is that if we know how one bit of information is stored we, we would want to kind of arrive at a model that stores one bit and then go to how n bits are stored and uh, this is kind of important when you're trying to uh, you know learn the c language again uh, you know not a lot of people focus on all of this uh, it is important from the standpoint that it empowers you to understand uh, what data the code is manipulating how that data is laid out and you can reason about that uh, layout of the data very accurately you know debugging becomes simpler so that's about it. So now let me propose this um, that you know there is an electrical component digital electrical component called the not gate it is also called an inverter right and the speciality of this device is if you give it the value of x it will invert that value for you it will make the opposite and x can only be uh, zero or one and if x was a zero it would give out output as one if x was one then it will give out the output as zero that's the idea of the inverter and with this as the base then let me further propose the following that if we took three uh not gates like right, three of them and connected first off two of them in a loop like this and then connected the third one here then um, my my claim is that if we were to put the value x here which is zero or one then we would get the same value uh, on the far right right and uh, let's kind of walk through that so it's x here becomes x bar here inverts it uh, that then travels down and there is x bar here which becomes x and then you know the loop continues what has happened now is the value of x is trapped here you know in a in a loop in a feedback loop and because we have x bar at this point you know we'll add another inverter here which makes it x so then if you carefully look at this this is capable of storing one bit of information right and of course you know the the power uh, to the circuit needs to be enabled that circuit needs to be uh, you know functional all of that is there uh, but if this loop works then these three inverters together can achieve uh, you know one bit of memory now this is how an sram is implemented sram is like a type of memory and one bit of sram is essentially you know the feedback loop now we, there are other ways to store bits um, it need not be just feedback based so for example another way is to use a capacitor right and we can load uh, charge on the capacitors capacitor again is an electrical uh, component which can store charge so you then say okay presence of charge is one and absence of charge is a zero right and this this forms the basis of the DRAM the huge 
you know, 8 GB, 16 GB memories that we have as RAMs on our desktop system, for example, those are implemented using capacitors, right? But uh, for our purposes, we'll continue to think uh, of the feedback-based uh, storage, right? So this is how then one bit of information was stored. Now let me propose something else, which is let's take this uh, one bit circuit, uh, modify it a little bit, you know, add some more circuits to it, uh, back and forth here and there. Uh, and let me just abstract it out into a primitive, which has three signals to it. One we call D, one we call Q, Q being the output, D being the input. And then there is something called a clock, right? And uh, we call this first off the D flip flop, right? So let's say this abstract, you know, entity is D flip flop, again, implemented using self, uh, the inverters and some extra circuit. Now what happens is, uh, let's first talk about the clock. So the clock is a signal that is meant to be going up and down, up and down, you know, rises up, falls down, rises up, falls down, uh, periodically, and this is called the period, right? Or it's called one cycle. So if you have heard of the terms like, you know, my CPU runs at 2.5 gigahertz, my computer's CPU runs at 2.5 gigahertz, so that gigahertz is referring to the cycle. Uh, right to the clock how fast it is moving up and down now what my claim is is if this value at d will be fed okay just a moment yeah so the value at d will be fed into the feedback circuit at every positive edge of the clock whenever the clock is rising up uh, you know then the d value will be absorbed in into the feedback loop and that will be available on Q, right? So then what ends up happening is, okay, what ends up happening is uh, at this point at the rising edge, if D was one, then that will get loaded into the feedback loop. So one is stored there somehow, like using the not gates. And then from this point on until the next rising edge, Q will be one. So Q will reflect D while there is you know, no rising edge of the clock right, during this time period. And after this, we have this another rising edge. And if D happens to be zero at this point, then zero would be loaded into the feedback circuit. And until the next edge, Q will be zero. Now at the next edge, if D happens to be zero, then Q will continue to be zero and so on and so forth. The idea being, that when there is no rising edge of the clock, the D flip flop will remember what was loaded within it in the previous rising edge, on the previous rising edge, okay? And D flip flop is like one bit of information for us at this point. Now let's build on this story and draw more abstractions. So we now take a bunch of D flip flops, right? And we say we are going to group them together. And then let's just you know name them as D3, D2 down to D0. And then each one of them has you know a D line that is coming in and a Q line that is going out. Right. So they have a Q line that is going out. And then let's say each one of them shares a clock. Right? So they all share the same clock. So this then is essentially storing four bits, right? It's storing D3 down to zero, four bits of information. And this can be simply drawn as, you know, other clock coming in. So CLK clock, we then draw a bus, then say Q3 down to zero, and then D3 down to zero, and uh, like this, right? Now, okay, so this was for bit of uh, bit register, right? Typically, uh, the least number of bits you can read and write on a computer system uh, is one byte, right? And one byte is equal to, or it's equal to eight bits. So you can then imagine a register, which is, okay, uh, let me just say, uh, which, 
has eight bits coming in, eight bits going out, right, and clock. So this is called a register. It's a it's a it's a eight bit register. And now what people have done is, or rather, obviously the next step in the abstraction is we combine multiple registers together. So there is a component called multiplexer, right, which can let's say take in seven bits of uh, information. It can take in a bus that is seven bits. It has got something called select lines, the, the multiplexer, which is also called MUX, right? And what it does is it can route it to one of the outputs, right? And they are numbered like so, blah, 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 right? So on each of these outputs there, you can imagine 8-bit register, 8-bit right? register. And they, they have like the clock, Know, available to them let's just not worry about the clock let's just think that it is available right so each one of them is getting like a clock and um, these are the data lines right d7 down to zero now what i'm suggesting is depending on what the select value is so if it was let's say two the the incoming lines will go to the second register counting from zero right so this would be routed here if select is two so that's the idea of a multiplexer. Takes in incoming lines and routes it to the outgoing lines. And when I should mention that all of these are buses as well. Right? These are multiple lines, seven down to zero. Then, and we had the eight bit register here. And then this is also connected. You know, the Q side is connected to another component called the DMUX, multiplexer. It does exactly the opposite of MUX. Right, and you have the Q7 down to zero. Now, uh, okay, and yeah, all of these are buses as well. Right? And you have the select lines here. Right? And uh, what will happen now is if the, okay, where is my highlighter? Yeah, so if this is now set to, let's say, three, then the third register content would be routed out to the Q lines. Okay, these these are Q lines, not D. Yeah. So that's the idea. So based on the select lines values, then we can select where to send the D7 down to 0, 2, which register to send them to. And let me also just name the register, right? So on and so forth. So you can send data into a register. And you can read data from a register as well, depending on the select lines. Now, there is little more magic that goes into, you know, a uh, little more circuit that goes into ensuring, you know, the D that you're sending in is rightly written to the register that you're intending and so on and so forth. But effectively, and also I show, okay. Um, so, okay, now let me just draw here. So effectively, what you can now start to imagine is, there are registers, there's like a linear set of them. Each one eight bits wide, right? And let me just R0, R1, write the names here, R3, so on, so Rn. Each one of them are like eight D flip flops. And uh, there is some other circuit around them such that, you know, you can have an incoming data bus, right? Incoming address bus aligned to convey whether it is the read operation or the write operation, and then another line which is the clock. Do you see what ha what's happening here? So now the address being provided here. Right, will go into doing the selection. Right, and then the data line here will either be on this side. If it's a write operation, then this path would be activated. If it's a read operation, then this path would be activated. Right, this path. And then the same, but depending on the read and write, data will either appear here if it's a read, 
or data will get in if it's right, right? And then there is a trace. So this then is how we think about memory. And each register here has an associated number with it, which we call address. Right? If address is 0x4, then the fourth register here is the one we are targeting, either reading data or writing data. So this is the model of the memory. And this will, this will really give you insights and abilities to be able to reason about what your C code is doing very accurately, right? And uh, I'll maybe also call out what our future goal is, where we are going with all of this. So we took a look at the memory model today. Uh, uh, you know, in the later video, we'll take a look at the CPU model. How are the internals of the CPU? What you should worry about? What you should not worry about? Very simple model, much like the memory model. And then we go to something called the ISA, Instruction Set Architecture. And then from there, we jump on to a little bit of assembly because, you know, understanding assembly is important and we it, it's straightforward, it's not difficult. There's just a way to look at the assembly code and you'll just understand it, right? And then from assembly, we make a case for why C as a language was developed, why C was required. And what will happen at this point when we go to C is we'll be able to reason backwards how the C converts to assembly, how the assembly relates to ISA, how the ISA controls the CPU and how does the CPU talk to the memory. Once you know all of this loop, uh, trust me, C language is a, is a breeze to learn. And my hope is that, you know, you stay with uh, me on this journey and um, yeah, I'll teach you C even if you don't want to learn it. And uh, that's about it. Thank that that that's it for this video. And thank you for sticking around this long. Uh, and see you in another video. Bye bye.